Okay, well I thought that I'd give you guys a tour of what I've been working on over the last few years. This is my Tascam TIAC Model 15. It's a lovely old analog desk, really quite like it. Transformer balanced on the uh, mic inputs. The rest of the board was originally unbalanced, but I've since balanced it. All apart from the inserts, I'm not using enough of them to warrant doing it really. I'll give you a brief tour around the console and show you the signal flow throughout because it's a little different to a lot of uh, other analog consoles that people are used to. So we'll start with the input module. At the top we've got a 20 decibel pad, uh, followed by an input select switch for mic line or mix mode. In mix mode, that takes your monitor inputs and lays them across the board in reverse order. Next we have a gain, and then we've got two aux. Um, these are pre or post, uh, pre to the left, post to the right, and in center position they're off. Then we've got a four band EQ. Um, we've got two shelves, 10K and 75 Hertz. And then we've got two fixed points uh, that we can select for lower mid-range or upper mid-range. So on lower it's 200 or 800 Hertz, and on the upper it's 3K or 5K. And it's worth noting that you actually need to switch in the uh, lower mid to use the uh, lower shelf and the upper mid to use the upper shelf. Next we have the bus routing. Uh, we've got four buttons here so we can only send to four buses at a time. Um, you've got one to four with this button out and with it in you've got five to eight. So if you want to send to seven and eight that would be the bottom two and if you want to send to three and four just this guy out. It's quite interesting the way they've designed this console because uh, you can actually switch in one and two and four and what that will do on the pan is make it so that to the left you've got one and two and all the way to the right you've got four. You can also switch in three and that would be three and four to the right and one and two to the left. After the uh, bus routing you've got a mute and a solo and then you've got your channel fader. So here we have the bus and monitor sections. At the bottom of the strips is the bus section, and then we've got monitor A and monitor B, which are on two rows of eight faders. At the top of the strip, we have another AUX control. Uh, this allows you to send either your bus signal to the left or your tape input signal to the right um, over to AUX A. And same again repeated on monitor B, but this time it's sending it to AUX B. Um, below your AUX, we have a monitor input select. You can select bus or tape. So bus, coming off the bus, coming up to here. Tape will be coming from the tape input, coming up to here. You next have a pan, so you can pan your monitor. So if you wanted to set up a stereo pair, you would have say one and two, and left and right, and then on your channel strips, you would have one and two depressed. So the signal flow would be in the strip, down to the bus, select one and two, bring your faders up on the bus, select the bus up here, bring these up to unity, left and right, and there we are. You can then control your panning from the channel strips, or if you feel like it, from the monitor section. So the next thing on the strip is an echo receive section. You have an input gain for each individual input, there's eight of them, one for each bus, and then you can select where you'd like to route it to, whether you route it to the bus, whether you route it to monitor A up here, or whether you route it to monitor B, or whether you send it to AUX A, which is over here. So the next thing we have is a trim control, or rather a bus gain. Um, the manual recommends you leave it at cow, which is for calibrating your faders, making sure you've got everything at unity. Um, but when you're running a big mix and you've got a lot of stuff going into maybe one or two buses, you may find you actually need to reduce the amount of gain the bus has to stop it from breaking up and distorting. And the last thing finally is a bus fader. So here we have the AUX master modules, AUX A master and AUX B master. At the top of AUX A we have an echo receive, so if you were sending to AUX A from your bus, this is where you receive it. You have a master control for AUX A, and then at the bottom you have a small blend control. 
uh, all the way to the left is receiving from AUX1 and all the way to the right is receiving from AUX3 or monitor A, AUX4 or monitor B, or you could have both. In the centre would be a blend between the two, full right, AUX3 or AUX4, full left, AUX1. It's very much the same with AUX B master. The only difference on AUX master B is that at the top of the channel strip we have an indicator select switch. Now what this does is it just changes the sensitivity of the overload LEDs on the input modules. Um, in normal mode they are set to plus 15 dB and in mixed mode they are set to minus 5 dB. So that can actually be quite handy if you've got a signal coming in, you're not sure which channel it's on, you're in a rush, just bang it over to mix and uh, you should see the overload LED flashing away and there's your channel. Next we have our master modules, the control room and the studio. They're more or less the same, apart from the control room has a solar level control on it. So when I'm soloing, I can control the level. Uh, they both have three line inputs. Then you have uh, AUX A, AUX B, monitor A, monitor B. And then you have an output fader. The last module we have is the talkback module. At the top of it, we have a test tone generator with a few fixed points. Um, you can either send this to the slate, that's to the left, the sensor position is off, or to the right, uh, to the test tone output on the back of the module. So you can patch it in wherever you would like across the board. The next three knobs we have are outputs for the microphone. So studio, aux A, or slate. And then if I'd like to engage any of those, all I have to do is hold down studio, aux A, or slate to talk back on any of those. Below this we've got a small headphone amp and we can choose to monitor it from the control room or the studio. Sensor position is off. And we've got a small game for the headphones and headphone jack mounted right at the bottom of the module. So this is the meter bridge that uh, I decided to add on to the console. I brought it on a complete whim. It's from a Studio Master Mixdown Classic 8 and it just happened to be the exact same size as the console which is Pretty unbelievable really. So I just bolted that onto the side, um, very easy job. And I've basically tapped the signal off the direct outs with a small buffer. Um, so along here we've got channels 1 to 24, which is coming off there. And then channels 25 to 32 on the meter bridge I could have from anywhere, but I settled with um, putting them on the bus because it's nice to uh, keep an eye on the transients when you've got a lot of stuff going to the bus, you, you kind of miss them on the old style VU meters. With the uh, VUs at the bottom, I replaced all the bulbs with um, the fused blue uh, LEDs. I think that made quite a nice touch. And uh, the master output um, VU meters, I decided that I'd put some color changing LEDs in there um, because after all it's the Rainbow Joe edition. <laughs> the balancing interface that I've built along with the uh, new jacks that I popped in that are balanced apart from the access send and receive which I just decided against for the sheer amount of current it would have to do it and also it's more stuff in the signal chain um, I, I couldn't really warrant doing it. What I've done on the jacks is that the direct out joins straight to the circuit ground but on the line in there is no ground so that way there is no ground loop formed. So for the access send and receive, what I've done, uh, because they're unbalanced and they still need to be connected to ground, is that uh, I've just popped a 100 nanofarad cap and 100 ohm resistor in parallel. And what that does is basically um, adds a bit of resistance and kind of hinders ground loops. The balancing card uh, I've mounted uh, on some little plastic pegs, which are uh, glued to the back of the uh, chassis. On some of the other modules I've drilled them, but uh, there just wasn't the space to do that on this. Also in previous posts I had used this switch at the back which I installed to basically uh, break the ground connection. 
what I've actually got this wired up now is to turn phantom power on and off. So here's the preamp section. Um, the most important two caps in the whole of the console to change are these two. Uh, 15 Pika Farad caps. Originally they're ceramic caps and they sound really gritty and they're microphonic. In fact, if you uh, were to tap on your uh, channel strip around here, you'd most likely pick that up when you're at uh, about half gain. So I changed them with some really high quality polystyrene caps and they just sound wonderfully transparent. They're not slurred like the uh, ceramic caps were in the high end. They really do sound nice. So this is the stock microphone input transformer. Um, there's a few posts on the net that say um, it's worth upgrading them to Jensen's or Sotas or Lundau's. And while I'm sure they've got a different sound, I don't think there's particularly anything wrong with this one. I, th I quite like the sound myself. Um, uh, so I couldn't really warrant spending the extra money to do it because it really adds up when you want to do it to 24 channels. Uh, this is the EQ section. I've replaced all of the caps in it with some uh, high quality uh, polystyrene caps. The K7 series, these long uh, gold capacitors, um, I think they were ex-Ukrainian military stock. Uh, they sound absolutely wonderful. Um, they are so transparent and clear, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, there were a couple of caps that I couldn't uh, get hold of, and they were the 150 nanofarads. Um, yeah, I couldn't find those in uh, polystyrene, so I settled for some metallized polyester caps. Um, they sounded pretty good, so I'm quite happy with that. I've also completely recapped the console, replaced all of the electrolytic capacitors with Panasonic FC and FM series, as well as a few uh, Nichicons um, where I couldn't find the uh, values in the FC or FM series. So that made a big difference to the sound. Everything sounded slightly uh, tighter and uh, cleaner. I've also replaced all of the off amps in the console with TL072s, apart from the master section, which has been replaced with uh, any 5532s. So here's the bus and monitor module with the balancing interface installed. I've replaced the unbalanced RCA sockets with balanced jacks. Uh, once again, I've got no grounds connected to inputs and I've got grounds connected to outputs. With the unbalanced access send and receive, it's the same as the input module, where I've connected the ground with a 100 ohm resistor in parallel with a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Once again, I've got the balancing interface on plastic supports, which are glued to the chassis, uh, because it was difficult to drill through this area. Here is the AUX A master module, and this is the balancing interface that I've installed. This one I've actually mounted via drilling holes and putting the little plastic supports through. Once again, the RCA jacks have been changed for balance jacks, and because they're all outputs, uh, the ground is connected across all of them. In the stock version, there's also a ceramic cap in the signal path on this, uh, which is C34. It's this cap here. It's a little 10 uh, picofarad cap. So I've changed that out for a high quality polystyrene. As you can see, both AUX Master A and AUX Master B are identical. So this is the control room module uh, with the balancing interface installed. Once again, like the AUX modules, I've mounted it through the chassis. Now because this module's got three stereo line inputs and two stereo outputs, it's quite a large card, but I managed to fit it in there quite nice and neat. Once again, the RCA jacks have been changed for balance jacks. They're wired the same as the other cards, with no connection to ground on the input, but with connection to ground on the output. In this case, I've got connection to ground via a 100 nanofarad cap in parallel with a 33 ohm 10 watt resistor. Now, the reason for using a larger wattage resistor here is because I'm connecting to a power amplifier on these outputs. 
if you get a ground loop with a power amplifier, it's potential you could get quite a bit more current traveling through the ground in the loop. Here is the uh, studio monitor module. Um, as you can see, most of the uh, PCB is empty on this um, because I use the same PCB for the control room in the studio. And there's only two outputs on this and no line in, so it's quite a small board. Once again, I mounted it to the chassis. And once again, I have a 33 ohm 10 watt resistor in parallel with a 100 nanofarad capacitor connecting the grounds, just in case I connect this output to a power amplifier instead of a headphone amplifier. So this is the talkback module and it's the only module um, which I haven't put a balanced output on. Uh, its only output is the test tone generator and for the time being I have no need for a balanced test tone signal. I'm sure that will probably change in the future. So this is the power supply module and this big bundle of wires is a combination of power and meter bridge. The black wires down here to the left are my feeds for the extra meter bridge whereas the uh, coloured wires that are bundled are mainly for the original meter bridge. Here you should be able to see the additional D-sub uh, 25 pin connectors I wired in to provide power and the signal to the new meter bridge. This black umbilical cable you can see here uh, is uh, the meter bridge sends which come off the direct outs for all the channels 1 to 24. Um, so it just runs underneath all the modules inside the chassis. You can also see that I've lined the bottom of the chassis uh, with some high grade tin foil. I then covered that in uh, plastic to uh, stop anything that fell onto it from shorting out. I have grounded this in the corner. So I should be able to show you where it's grounded, which is down there in the corner via that red cable. And that runs alongside the uh, motherboard support uh, to the central grounding point on my ground bus. So this is the PS15 power supply, which I repaired. It's been completely recapped. I've changed um, the transistors in it. I changed the two SD111s to two N3055s. They can handle a bit more current. And I also replaced the two SB524s for tip 32As because they can also handle a little bit more current. I matched the voltage regulators of the uh, plus and minus 16.5 volt rails. Um, I've also changed the voltage regulators on the other rails for more modern versions. I've also added an extra bit of filtering, although you can't see it here without me having to remove um, the PCB um, because it's on the back, uh, which was uh, an extra couple of um, caps in parallel. Down here is the phantom power supply which I built and the transformer for it is over here. Over here is the meter bridge power supply and here is the transformer for it. This is a view of the back of the high rose connector which I've replaced and completely rewired. To the right of it there is a switch with the yellow wires attached, that's for the phantom power. I decided to remove the 2-pin XLR socket there and just replace it with a master phantom power switch. Okay, to give you guys an idea of the sound of the console now, especially the EQ, I'm going to play a little bit of white noise for it and I'm going to sweep each of the bands.
next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time with pink noise. Okay, to give you guys a quick idea of what the console sounds like uh, when you're sort of um, tracking and mixing through it, um, I thought I'd load up a project that I tracked recently. Um, it was all through this console. Um, I haven't done anything to it yet. So we'll start with the kick drum first. Lots of uh, 200 hertz in there. Now, that's the 5K. This is the 3K. Personally, prefer the uh, cleanness of the 5K. Let's get the kick sub in there. Lots of 200 hertz that we don't want. Let's take that out. That doesn't sound too bad. Snap. Bit of a ring to it. Let's take that out. 800 hertz ring. And then a bit of a high shelf. You can really hear how that opens up the snare with that on with it off. So we'll definitely have that. A bit of under snare in there. Again, a bit of 800 hertz. Let's take them out. Okay, let's get the hats in. Let's take out that 800 hertz nastiness that we don't want. Doesn't sound too bad. Let's chuck the broom in. bit of 200 out of the room. Yeah, not too bad. Let's have a go with the guitars. So they're quite muddy in the uh, upper mids again, around a K. I'll take out 800 on them. Take a bit of bass out. They're a bit scratchy as well. Let's take a bit of 3K out. Okay. Bass as usual, lots of 200 hertz in there. I'd say. Um, not too bad really. 